Good morning and welcome to another week of Dateline New Haven on WNHHFM, your home for community radio at 103.5 live streamed at newhavenindependent.org. I'm your host, Paul Bass, inviting you to look behind the headlines on the stories that make our community tick. Well, someone who really makes our community tick, one of my favorite guests to have on Dateline New Haven is with us today, J.R. Romano, the state Republican chairman and a guy who does not back away from the fight. How are you doing, JR? Are you there? Good, Paul. I'm trying to share, I'm trying to share on Facebook while doing this all at the same time. Modern you know, technology. So, you know, I've been noticing how much trouble people have been having staying connected with all the demand on the internet. You said your internet went out at your house, so now you're on your uh, phone network. I'm on my phone, so I'm trying to do two things at once because my computer I can't get on to, to share yeah. on a separate device, right? So, um, yeah, modern world. Well, talking about the modern world and talking about two or three things at once, that's actually what I want to talk to you about today, JR. How you run a state party and campaigns and elections when a country is in lockdown and freaked out about the worst public health crisis in 100 years. What's that like, JR? Yeah. First of all, how you make it out personally? How you make it out personally? You feeling um, good? Yeah, no, my, my family, we've been very lucky. Um, I, it has impacted some of the greater Republican community and some of my personal friends. Um, but, you know, I, I think November's coming no matter what, right? Yeah. I mean, there's no way the election November are going to be delayed. Even, even if it was in the best interest of, of health, I don't think that the Democrats would be happy with the president saying, let's delay it till January, right? right. So um we've actually been developing a couple different strategies and i actually mentioned this to you in, a, in our call last week where i don't want to divulge exactly what we're doing because it actually is pretty clever and it's not like a normal election year where we would just say do doors do mail do like th there are different techniques um in in order to gauge the community with this technology so we're, we're going to be we're going to be keeping that to ourselves for a little bit um to try to maximize the impact that, because frankly, this, this, and I don't, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, something like this benefits the incumbent mm. because it's harder to get your message heard. It's harder to communicate with voters. Um, and, you know, the incumbent, and, and I'm not being critical, but it's true. The incumbent is someone that a, a local person would turn to for information on COVID, for information that the, that the state's giving out, the federal government's giving out. Um, so there are some challenges to being a, a, a challenging candidate, um, but it doesn't mean that it, um, a challenger can't win. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're going to be testing this week, because in the state, you, have, you know, the Republicans have a lot fewer, hundreds of thousands of fewer voters than the independents, although a lot of those people lean Republican in statewide elections, but not congressional elections, I would argue. And, uh, well, and you're pretty close to the legislature. Yeah. I mean, the legislature people seem to like. Yeah, I, I mean, right. Well, politics, and as an Italian, and, and I'm, I don't know if, you know, being a, the New Haven Independent, I'm, I'm sure uh, there's a vast, a large number of Italians that watch the show. Campaigns are like good sauce. Um, a big <laughs> ingredient to a solid campaign is money. Um, and with our in the congressional field, you have, um, you know, the, the Democrats have a money advantage that, that sometimes is difficult to overcome. I mean, even in 2018, uh, I think we talked about this last time I was on the show, Democrats outspent Republicans by $30 million and they barely got over the goal line um, in many of these races. So, you know, it's, it's, um, but I do think that this state is not as blue. And I think you would agree based on the election results. Uh, oh, I think, I think when it comes to state elections, this is a purple state through and through. We had 12 years of, I guess 14 years of, uh, 12 years of Republican governors. And then we had, you know, uh, eight right. years of Democrat, and we had a divide. We had an equally divided state senate until a year ago, and then, but yet, all our congressional representatives are blue. Well, we and I, I know argument. you're not going to see it this way. I would argue that Nash, are, the way Connecticut, the way a lot of Republican-leaning New Englanders think, the Republican Party nationally doesn't speak for them, but their state Republican parties do. Well, one of the one of the big talking points that Democrats often use for federal races is gerrymandering, but they never seem to, you know, whenever a, a district is gerrymandered to help a Democrat, it's it's completely legit. So if you look at the design of some of Connecticut's congressional district, there's some oddities there. Um, 
And we can go into the fact how they've been uh, gerrymandered. Uh, that fifth district and the first district number two in particular are amazing if you look at them at a map. Um, I always thought the third district was amazing that part of Middletown where you have Wesleyan students got added to a liberal district that was concerned about conservative suburbs. Right, but if you look at the first, and, and the reason they did that was because they wanted to extend into the suburban area in the fifth mm which is that upper Northwest corner where they're grabbing Canton and all these other towns now in the first district. And you've moved Meriden, who geographically, when you think Meriden and Danbury are in the same congressional district, when Meriden, it, it's just, you, there's a case to be made that the, that the Connecticut districts have been gerrymandered to benefit the Democratic Party. Well, I guess, Certainly. I mean, I think you understand the bias of your interviewer, which is that both parties do well, it. I know. Well, I, I know that, but but it, all you have to do is look at the map. Look at how the first district kind of has this hook into the into the into the Litchfield County. So now the other question, and this might be a little bit too much into the weeds, is you're talking about how important money is, and that's why incumbents tend to stay in Congress because they're raising money from the moment they're in, and they're able to give favors. And both parties do that. But um, this year, you have a presidential race in which the presidential candidate for the Republican has so much more money. Than the Democrat. I mean, it's not even close, but it's unclear how much of that trickles down, especially when you have a state where I would argue that two years ago, the Democrats won big for state offices, all because people wanted to vote against Donald Trump, it had nothing to do with the candidates. Will that work in reverse where there's such an anti-Trump? Will you again be facing an anti-Trump vote or will you be benefiting from the, the hundreds of millions of dollars advantage you're going to have for the presidential well, I, race? I think Although that well, might I think what, what you're not estimating is, is in 2008, well, right, part of that money won't be spent in Connecticut, but you're also not going to have Chris Murphy dropping $15 million on organizational operations right. in town committees to help the senators and the state reps, right? That money's gone. Ned Lamont's money's not there. Chris Murphy's money's not there. And so you don't have that. The only thing the Democrats will have um, is you do have some congressional candidates um, and you, they always have the unions that are out there that are being paid to be out there uh, knocking doors. But when you are talking $30 million from 15 million from Chris Murphy and organizational and operational expenses, paying for paying for door knockers, paying for all stuff, that money's not there. And so you're, you're being brought back to almost par for the Republican Party. Jared, Justin Farmer, thank you for listening and writing in, writes in, um, what about prison gerrymandering? So his point is that a lot of urban people are in jails in places like Somers and Cheshire, but they get listed as living in those towns, even though they can't vote there. And that has definitely been an advantage to the Republicans. And I agree with you, JR, there are other ways Democrats have driven, re redrawn maps to help them with other voters. But I think Justin's got a point that felons who are in jail who can't vote are counted toward Republican districts. Well, so when you say that, loses, you just said they can't vote. Right. But then the city loses their population. So if there are, say, 5,000 people in New Haven or 3,000 behind bars, we don't get to count them for population purposes when our district is drawn. I mean, this, you're familiar with this fight. Right. Democrats want them to count at their home. I mean, I, I understand that, but, but it, right. I mean, I, okay, but we're talking, particularly in the state of Connecticut, we're not talking hundreds of thousands of people, mm -hmm. um, and you know, I, that's that's small to me. That's small compared to when you're you're throwing in a, an entire community into a district that gets swallowed up by, say, New Haven. Mm -hmm. That that okay. basically New Haven, two cities control an entire congressional district, right? And then sometimes so when you when you add up, um, well, and that's you, it's not going to be it's not a perfect system. It's never going to be perfect. And in the South, there's been sort of an understanding for decades between the Republican Party and African American Democrats, where they get all the African American voters crammed into the district to ensure that African Americans will be elected. But then the Republicans win more seats permanently because there are fewer candidates who appeal to a mix of black Democrats and liberal white candidates. So this stuff really gets complicated. It doesn't always work out the way people think. I don't know. I'm getting a little off. Let me well, just and I, I would also point out, I, I think it's ironic. Yeah. Well, but, okay. but I, and I'm going to be critical of the Democratic Party and you're going to laugh. But 
in Connecticut, these, these areas that have um, people of color are all represented by, by trust fund wealthy white guys. Yeah, uh, that's the Democratic Party. Every major city in the state of Connecticut is represented by trust one percenters, not guys like me from Derby, Connecticut, you know, a single mom. These are people who are millionaires, if not billionaires, all representing cities like New Haven, Middletown. Uh, uh, um, oh, what was the other one? Uh, New Haven. And they're not Bridgeport. even from the cities. Bridge, well, Bridgeport, Gannon from Bridgeport. But these other guys aren't even from the cities they represent. The Democratic Party's turned into the party of the of the one percent of the billionaires because you Nedlam. I mean, I I can list all these extremely wealthy white people who are controlling major cities, controlling the Democratic Party. And it's interesting when you when people want to talk about the Republican Party, but all you have to do is look at the actual statistics of what's happening in these cities. All right, we're talking to J.R. Romano. He's the state Republican chairman. We're doing our best with the technology, and we're here on Dateline New Haven, WNHH 103.5 FM, live streamed at newhavenindependent.org. Got a couple more questions here for you, J.R. Rodney Williams says, what is the plan for the minority vote when so many minorities and minority businesses are on the ropes because of this virus? You are right, the state is purple. I think but minority he... votes usually decide who wins for governor. So I think what Rodney's asking is, are you going to make a play for the black vote? You always say you will, but what is the plan? Your sound's off, JR. Do you want to check your audio? Sorry about that, JR. Do you want to make sure your audio is on? Sure. There you go. Can you hear me? Yep. All good. I'm back. Yep. Okay. So there's to me, when whenever you talk about voters in terms of uh, of uh, you know the African American community, obviously have as concerns that need to be addressed. But at the end of the day, I think we as, a, as, as communities need to understand there's three things we all want, safe schools, a good job, and a safe community to live on. I, I don't think that is any different from uh, someone who's African-American to someone who's Latino to someone who's white. Not, all that is the same. The, the difficulty is, is when you try to have a conversation about policies that can impact, immediately Republicans are dismissed as being racist because the Democrats have done a tremendous job uh, convincing people to not listen to anyone else but them. And the problem, and particularly, is that whether people want to admit it or not, the Democrats in these have... Oh, boy, you, you faded out again, JR. Sorry about that. Do you want to try your audio again? Off the Democratic Party. There you go. I, so I, a town chairman keeps calling me. They're not getting a clue that I can't talk right now. So that they're interrupting the, the interview. Um, so sorry about that. Um, so, I mean, making a play for the African-American voter, I, I mean, I've been willing to sit down and talk to any community. I've been willing to sit down and talk policy. I've been willing to talk about uh, how school choice can impact and make the African-American community better. I, I mean, the problem is, is it, it we want it to be, uh, we want the opportunity, but we're never given the opportunity to actually have that conversation. You have to make the opportunity, JR. Nobody gives you anything in politics. I have, Paul. Yes. I've asked. I've asked to sit down. I've asked, I, I've gone to, I went to a, a, a meeting of church leaders down in Norwalk. I can't, I can't kick down the door. You know, I, I, I you know, I, you know what I'm saying? Like, I am more than willing to sit down to any community to talk about policies that are impacting their lives the policies that I believe could make their lives better, particularly from the Republican lens. Um, and often they don't even want to have the conversation and not all, but a lot of these community outreach groups, um, there's just this assumption that somehow Republicans don't care about, about people of poverty. And it's a, it's laughable when you consider who our candidates are, when you consider, uh, you know, who our people in power are, particularly in Connecticut. And you got a couple more people. Julia was not impressed. She said deflection. But Bob McCormick asked along the same lines, will there ever be a Republican That's mayor? In 1951, JR, was the last time a Republican was elected mayor in New Haven. There was no one running on the ballot as a Republican last time. And there are zero members of the Board of Alders, zero state reps. So what do you think? Well, look, I think the, the, the problem is, is that elections are about contests. And so when someone go, walks, it's very hard to convince someone to run when it's already perceived that they're going to lose. So I think when, when people in New Haven start to realize that the Democratic Party has made things more expensive and more difficult, that's when you'll start to elect Republicans. Because 
the answers to a lot of the problems, the Democrats have had ample time to solve, and they can't. And they Republicans. I'm sorry, J.R. Romano has been joining us by phone. His internet is out at his home, but we hear, see him popping back up. And you listen to Dateline New Haven, 103.5 FM, live streamed at newhavenindependent.org. Rodney Williams said to you, give me a call. It's time for everyone to work together. We're going to give J.R. a minute to um, get back on the air here Am I back? at uh, Dateline New Haven. Am I back? Are you back there, J.R.? I think so, yes. Okay, JR, um, I, I've been trying to get the conversation. Uh, Rodney Williams says, give me a call. It's time for him to work together. JR, tell us about what conventions are coming up, who you're running in the New Haven area for Congress, state rep, and how are we going to see conventions so, in a year when everything is online? Well, so we, we've actually, we're using an online platform. We, we do have a candidate. Oh, boy. I'm really sorry, folks, that the technology is punking out on us so much. JR is using his phone. His town chair is trying to call him. His internet's out. They keep interrupting. You back there, JR? We see you here He's on muted. Daylight. He's muted now. Okay. Can you unmute, unmute, JR? Thanks for rolling I'm with the technology, JR. Me. No, I appreciate that you're rolling with the technology. Uh, I'm over. trying here. You, you are trying. You're doing a good job. Um, so you're, you're running some candidates for Congress <laughs> against Rosa DeLauro, who's been there 30 years, tough person to beat, a lot of money. Who's running in the third district and when is the convention and how can the public watch it? Um, it's on our YouTube channel. The convention is, uh, I think, Wednesday, this Wednesday. I thought um, it was Tuesday. And uh, hmm. I'm sorry? I thought it was Tuesday. Oh, boy. All right, you listen to Dateline New Haven, J. Romano, state chairman, trying to trying to uh, stay on the air, stay on the internet to tell you what's up with the Republican Party in the state here. JR is coming back. And then we have another question. He's telling us about a, an opponent to Rosa DeLauro in the third district. Going to have a. Um, okay, you're back, JR. Her name is, uh, yes, uh, she's actually raised Rosa this quarter. Um, she, uh, her name is Margaret Stryker. She's from Milford, uh, um, very track candidate. Uh, she's resume is amazing. Um, so we're excited. And I think it's about time Rosa, you know, had a real challenger who had substantial backing. She's been there a very long time. Um, and although you know, Rosa is a woman is very lovely, I just completely disagree with her on pretty much everything <laughs> that's out there. Um, all right. Well, um, I think what we're going to have to do is we're going to thank, we'll give it one more shot. And then otherwise we'll have to thank JR for coming on because he keeps uh, popping out today. JR, um, what about conventions? How important, you said that the conventional one will be available for everyone to watch. All the state rep uh, center ones, which no one attends anyway, to watch. You're not going to be doing those publicly. Oh, can I jump in real fast? Oh. Yeah. JR, you should probably keep your video off. Maybe your, you know, your phone is struggling with the bandwidth. Try just staying on audio. Shut off your camera and see if that helps. I Harry keep getting Rose, our station manager. So yeah, what do you I think just, about that, JR? Do you want to try that? I keep getting kicked out and then back. Right, so in. I'm wondering if you could. What Harry's suggesting is that you keep on the audio but not the video. You just click on okay, video. And then it will require less bandwidth. Let's try this. Yeah. And you're watching this in real time, folks. Radio and video on WNHH in the era of COVID. We're doing this through Zoom, patching it on Facebook, airing it on 103.5 FM. And now we're trying to, Harry George, our station manager, is troubleshooting. J.R. Romano, like a lot of people in America, he lost his internet connectivity for a while because there's been such demand. And now we're going to see if having him just on audio, and this is radio after all, having him just on audio will enable him to stay on the air and not continually um, face All right, is that, is that, let, let's see what happens now. All right, so you got this candidate, third district. She's raising money. She's serious. Rose has been in there 30 years, very strong candidate. You also have a woman in the first district, you said, who's 
the first open lesbian to run for Congress yes. against Thomas John Larson. Who is she? Uh, Mary Fay. She's she's actually on the uh, town council in West Hartford. Um, very excited. She's run for state senate up there before. She's uh, another great candidate. Uh, great resume. Um, we have David Sullivan in the fifth congressional district. Um, there's a couple candidates in the fourth, uh, and then there's two candidates in the second congressional district. So now they'll have. Um, so you're going to be putting on YouTube these conventions. Why is it that you're not airing? I asked this off the air. Why is it that you don't want to air the conventions for state Senate and state rep? Is it just too much hassle and nobody cares anyway? Or do you think there's a reason people might want to watch if they're contested? Well, well no, it's it, the, the, the reality is, is, is I don't think we actually have the bandwidth because 90% of the conventions go off the same night mm. at 7 p.m. So um, that's, that is, it's more about a, a functional issue. And, and when it comes to these state senate, if, if we weren't in the era of, of COVID and doing these digitally, you know, no one would be tuning in. Right. Okay. Uh, now we may pick, we may pick one or two that we want to possibly highlight, but all of them would be very difficult. Chair, you talked about how in a year like this, it's hard, and we do have some questions we'll get back to, but you say it's hard for, it's advantages to the incumbent even more than usual, because it's, you can't knock on doors. It's hard to get your message out, to have a new person be heard, and the incumbent, if they're smart, I think they all haven't been smart on this, but if they're smart, they show up and give out a lot of help, masks, information to people about how to get their unemployment benefits and use the advantages of incumbents in that way, which Deloro does in a big way. Some state legislators do and some don't. So you said you don't want to give away secrets about what tech platforms you're using to get the message out, but in more general terms, in concept, because this isn't going to be a secret, what are people going to be seeing from your candidates in terms of how they're going to get their message out if they're not incumbents? Well, obviously, I think that you, you there's there's always platforms like this, which I think is going to be something that not only, um, uh, uh, which we'll call it, um, not only is something we'll use now, but I think going forward, we might we might advance the way the candidates interact. Um, so it's using digital platforms. It's having town halls. They're probably going to get back to using the phone a lot more um, and text message. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's probably the direction we're going to go. You know, candidates may spend uh, uh, you know doing town halls on Saturday afternoons versus doing doors. Uh, mm -hmm. It's pretty much um, what what the what I think the average candidate will do. I think one of the important things uh, to understand, and one of the things I'm certainly going to talk about, and we're encouraging all candidates to talk about, is now that COVID has happened is and is here, and our economy struggles. You know, do do constituents out there? You know, Democrats rose raised taxes in 2019. They did, and so will those tax increase delay or hinder a recovery from this from from the covid uh, uh pandemic because we know connecticut never fully recovered from the 2009 uh economic slowdown or crash and so these are things that we're reminding voters that the democrats have put us in a pretty bad position um and you know how is it going to impact your your family when once again they're going to go back to hartford in 2020 and raise taxes um, because that seems to be their only solution. So that's kind of some of the, you know, the conversations that we're yeah, going to have. And one way they hit you back, I don't know if this will penetrate the voters or not. One thing I'm hearing a lot from Democrats is that when there were disagreements about the budget last year, the Republicans wanted to draw down on the rainy day fund to pay for transportation with the argument that it was funded so much higher beyond actuarial standards that there was enough to spend, you'd still have plenty. The Democrats say, thank God we didn't raid the Day, rainy day fund because now that we have this crisis we're going to have enough money to weather it because the rainy day fund did they have a good point about that jr uh, no and and frankly because the way they're looking at this is they're weathering they're not weathering they're, they're the state is not in good fiscal shape even even with the rainy day fund being available because it's about tax revenues and i understand the way a democrat thinks we must feed the government the government must have all the money in my mind, raising taxes takes money out of a single mom working in New Haven as a dental hygienist. She's the one the Democrats should care about, 
not the special interests and the government spending. So, so makes, to me, she's a single mom, and if she makes under fifty, under sixty thousand a year in New Haven, does she pay any tax to the state under the earned income tax credit? Sixty, yeah, the earned income tax credit is thirty thousand. That's why I specifically talk about a single mom making, you know, a dental hygienist making between fifty and seventy-five thousand dollars a year. That's who the Democrats. That's who they're reaching in and taking money out of their pocket. And so when you talk about this, you know, Republicans want to talk about you and your family. Democrats want to talk about the government, how the government needs funding. And and that's a great point, Paul. You said we're lucky we have this fund to keep the government going. Meanwhile, families around the state are struggling to put food on the table. Families around the state uh, are looking at this like we don't have enough savings. Connecticut is one of the most taxed states in the country, which means but, but when you talk about government going, I see your points here, but to keep them going includes emergency food and includes unemployment benefits, what they screwed up a lot because the computer system. Right, but, but keep well, going well, we, can have a convers- help the we can have a conversation of priorities, but you and mm-hmm. I both know it's not as though the Democrats have, have this keen eye on spending wisely. I would I would agree with you that the money the money the government does sh- spend should be invested in the areas that take care of people. You know, we we have lots of things that they do that have nothing to do with that. Mm-hmm. So, uh, J.R. Romano, state Republican chairman here in Dateline, New Haven. What about how the state's been uh, dealing with the crisis, separate from taxing issues? Unlike in other states, we have not had, at least among elected officials partisan battles. We've had what I could call a partisan moment. It's not that they agree with everything, but Len Fasano, Themis Clarity, who are the Republican leaders, Martin Ludy, Joe A to Z, and the Democratic governor have pretty much agreed about emergency measures. You know, they're talking about they want the reopening to think about how these small businesses are getting back together. But on the big questions about when to reopen, listening to experts, closing the schools, not having the legislature in session, emergency orders to the governor, spacing decisions. There has been no agree- disagreement on the big issues. Are you with Themis and Len that it's so, been done pretty responsibly? So I, I, the problem that I have with what the governor's done, and, and again, it's not, and, and this is the best way I can explain it. I don't think that Ned Lamont's a bad guy. Like Dan Malloy was kind of, he could be a jerk, right? I think Ned is making and, and doing things sometimes uh, on, on the cuff and it's causing problems. And frankly, the committee that he put together to look at the reopening is, I, I it, it's an okay group, but it doesn't include actual small business owners. To, to make an order that you, you can open a salon, but you can't use a hairdryer. Um, there's all these small little nuances. I was wondering things. about that one. Cause you know, I understood why you can't use a hairdryer. But how can you have a salon without a hairdryer? That very thing jumped out at me. So do you so, think but, the salon should open? Do you well, think but, but, uh, well, but here's, the, here's the problem that I have is that the, the rhyme and reason behind it, why? Because, okay, we're blowing air around, but it's heated to a point like it just doesn't, there's no logical sense. And frankly, and this goes back to this committee that they put together, it's just him and his really wealthy friends that are going to tell everybody else when it's time for them to make money. And mm-hmm. so you have a lot of people struggling. So th- he's, he's had these kind of what I would call privileged mistakes where he doesn't really understand how the rest of us live. Mm-hmm. Actually, I'm not going to disagree with you one bit about that. Similar. But, but, but what about the putting yourself in his position? Okay, that's the, on the outside, it is your job to look at what he's not doing right. But right. These are, very, these are very tough decisions. I honestly, JR, don't know what I would do. In no, his and that's fair. Would, but, you would you open? Would you let the salons open? Since you're right, they need hair blowers. <laughs> I mean, I, I think the way that I looked at it is, is that when when we this was always about flattening the curve, and they always said two weeks after there's a, a when when the hospitalizations drop, right? And now they're they're moving the goalpost a little bit, but but I think from my perspective is is that there are people that can't survive economically right now and what we're doing. And there's, and again, I'm going to go back to the, it doesn't seem like Ned is talking to Republicans. He's not, he's not, he's just talking to his really wealthy friends that think, oh, we'll, we'll delay this, we'll delay this. And, and frankly, what frustrates me is the inconsistency in, in, in how they're making these decisions. So I'll give you a, an example. He tells us all that we, it's, we're, it's okay to go to, 
um, Home Depot and Walmart. Um, we can't, we're, but we can't, you know, we can buy baby clothes at Walmart, but we can't buy baby clothes from a small business owner, right? You're actually forcing more people to go to one location versus spreading it out. You know, so, so you're, you're right about that, JR, but wouldn't it also be fair to say that Democrats, Republicans, everybody has tried to understand a fluid situation? We don't even fully understand the coronavirus. The best experts have completely changed their minds in a period of weeks. Well, Paul, don't wear a mask. Do wear Paul, a mask. No, no, Paul. I, that's why you haven't seen me be hypercritical. I point yeah, that's out. That's what I'm wondering. Yeah. Yeah, I, I point out these, and and this is the problem when it gets pointed out. Right. When it gets pointed out, just fix it. You know what? You're right. We, you should be able to buy baby clothes from that local store. But you I'm not sure be. that's the answer, Jr. because right. if I look at I look at the small stores like near me, man, there is no way they're ever going to follow any reasonable social distancing. There's no way that people are going to be more than an inch from each other. There's no way. But that's that people, but Paul, that's happening in Walmart. People pass each other all the time. And, and but they wear the mask there. I'm not saying they're right. I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you about the the inconsistency when i'm right, saying this, that this, i this honestly is don't know the solution jr because some uh, right but paul argue, i would argue I, I have i have i have faith in people and business owners you don't it would sound like because i think a business owner that wants to appeal to the general public that has a fear would announce that they're holding people accountable and if they announce that they're not people won't go there well i i i i, I like that outlook and I do have faith in the overwhelming majority of people. I have faith in the overwhelming majority of business owners. We've seen enough photographs and I've seen with my own eyes how already stuff isn't followed to the T and how this spreads. So one argument made, JR, is that if you're worried about people making a living, if you open too soon, that will be the last economy to recover long term because you're going to have such a wave again. And this is all guesswork. But the I, idea I, I, is that if you open too soon, that if you look, to, and this is old data, but if you look at the um, 1918 pandemic, the places that opened sooner had the worst economies long term because people. Right, but, got but Paul, let's be honest. Hold on, let's be honest. In 1918, how accessible was disinfectant? How accessible was hand sanitizer and and masks and all those? They didn't have. In fact, I think there's been technology just learning about how viruses yeah. are spread compared to 1918. So it's not really. So it's not that you have more confidence in people. You have more confidence than I do that we have the tools right now to contain the pandemic. And again, I don't have a position about what we should do because I think it's really complicated and there are unknowns. But where you and I, I think differ is I don't believe we have the, um, the tools right now to prevent us from spreading this wildly. Again, I think Georgia is going to be the big hot spot and they're going to spread it all over the country the way New York did. I mean, I, I, listen, I understand what you're saying, Paul. I just, I, I, my perspective is the way that I look at this is if you're going to do something, be logical. And I'll give you a prime example. You tell someone that they can go to Walmart, but they can't go to church. Right. You tell, so, so I'll give you a prime example. You're telling me. Do you want them to die in church? Well, hold on, a, hold on, hold on a second. And this is where I have faith in people. I, I have faith that a pastor could literally put tape just like Walmart does that is six feet apart in the pews. I mean, there's there's hundreds of things that I that that creativity, because here's the thing, the public doesn't want to get sick. Okay, so JR, the public doesn't want to get sick, but there's a lot of misinformation, a lot of short-term decisions. So while you and I have faith that the overwhelming majority of pastors, the overwhelming majority of people can do it, we know as a fact right in New Haven, we can trace a lot of deaths to mid-March when pastors ignored the directions from the government, Republican and Democratic levels of government. A lot of people have died in New Haven because religious leaders did not follow their directives in March. Death, devastated right. and, congregations. And 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 again, I I understand that, Paul. But but I'm what I'm saying is is that if we constantly look at the lens of so at first it was flatten the curve. So now you're saying that we have to stay in our homes to prevent all death. No. I'm saying I don't know. I'm saying it's not about not having faith in people. I'm so, saying that I'm really at a loss. I don't think there are good guys and bad guys in this argument. I don't think. Oh, I, I, I agree, but that goes I don't back think to. I'm being cruel. I think I'm just very skeptical when I look out. I, I, 
I'm very, I think we're gonna have a bad second wave. I really do. And I think it's gonna so, hurt so our Paul, economy. This goes back to the idea of what we're doing. So if the government put out guidelines like, okay, we're gonna tell Walmart or whatever to lay, to lay tape down six feet and aisles and point and, and separate. What I'm saying is take that logic and apply to everybody. Right. I, I agree because, with you. And I think they're gonna do with that. I agree with you on the small business versus Walmart. I'm thinking more about types of businesses. Um, Judith Leach writes, how do you hold everyone accountable? Rodney Williams says, but why should big business make money and small business go out of business? He is speaking the truth, thanks. And he is J.R. Romano, state Republican chairman. We got a really good line now. Harry Joyce, our station manager, figured out the issue. We Thank got J.R.'s God. picture here, but we're, we're gonna be here just good. So J.R., next session, the Republican party is gonna have all new leadership at the Capitol. Yes. The four main leaders in the legislature are the majority minority leader in each house. Themis Clarities and, and Len Fasano are the leaders of the Republicans. They've been there for decades and they're retiring, although Themis might be running for governor. And in the Democratic side, one of the two leaders is also retiring, Joe Arasanovitz. I'm sorry, I don't say his name right. They call him Joe A to Z. Do you know how to say his name? You said it right, Arasanovitz. Oh. No, I said it really fast so you couldn't hear how I said it. <laughs> um, what's this going to mean? That you're gonna, is it just changing well, people? Well, let's be honest, but hold on. But, but let's be honest, You, we may have four leaders because Looney's facing a primary. Yeah, but okay, okay. I, I'm not, I, look, I have no idea, but it, yeah. it would be amazing if you you literally had all new leadership at the same time. I think that would, yeah. I think that might be the first time in our history that that happens, but. So what's gonna mean on the Republican side? Will it be a different direction? Will they operate differently from Themis and Len Fasano and Themis Clarity? Yeah, well, obviously, the, the, you know, they're, they're different. Um, you know, I think in the House, uh, they, they generally know who it's gonna be. Um, I think in the Senate, there's still some jockeying who it's gonna be. Um, but, but Len and Themis, um, you know, aren't going anywhere. Um, I, I think their stamp will be on the Republican Party. Um, so it's not like they're like moving to, you know, North Dakota or something, right? They're, they're still going to be involved. They have tremendous relationships within that building and within the caucuses. Um, so, you know, I, I have to say we, we've all gotten, a, gotten uh, along really well together. Um, you know what no one understands and I understand there was a lot of disappointment in 2018 because we were we were so close to having majorities and the governorship but truth be told even after 2018 Republicans have what would be considered a high watermark for the number of representatives in the last 40 years um, you know everyone thinks that this was a blue wave in 18 but the, you know I, I ran in 2006 when we went down to 38 members of the house um, no, and I actually so, think the Republicans are highly influential. I mean, the budget they passed they two are. years ago with Democrats was their budget. And I do think we have a purple legislature. I think yeah, both so, parties know that it's not as liberal an environment as it is with the same voters for Congress. So I think, I, I don't think, you know, like, for example, in the House, if it ends up being Vinnie Candelora, Vinnie's a little different than Themis. I think, um, you know, leadership style, I think in both chambers may change a little bit, but, but so. ultimately... Well, just, I mean, like any other person, you know, never, you know, if you have a general, not every general has the same leadership style. I mean, we'll be um, more combative, less bipartisan, more to the right, more conservative. Well, you think, you think, you think Len and Themis are combat, uh, you don't think they're combative? I think they're, they're tough. Right. But they also, I think Connecticut is an outlier in this country. They stake a position, they believe in it, they fight for it, they also govern. And they respect each, both sides respect each other, and they make compromises without compromising their values. I think they have a pretty good record the last couple of years. When you want to look at the bipartisan work that was done on on medical user fees on the budget, it's not that they always agree or that they should. But no, I, I don't think, think that's going to. I don't think that's going to change. Avoided the dysfunction that other. I don't states. think that's gonna, well. You you may think that, but I can I can tell you behind the scenes. You know, the, the Democrats always talk about civility, but they're they're some of the the, the worst when it comes to going after. I'm quoting people. your people. I'm quoting. Big, no, I know, but on you, the radio I, show, they I, think that this is what Len Fasano. I Themis agree, no, I understand that, but I'm simply saying, like when Len, when you know Matt Lesser calls Themis a sexist in the middle of the chamber, uh, you know th that's what I mean when I when I'm I not say saying that. there are moments when both sides have people who say ugly stuff. I'm saying that the two parties' leadership has operated in a way that's different from other states. They've had different points of view and they've governed. Yeah, no, I, I don't I, I don't expect that to change. Um, you know, Would I, you I like think to see Themis Clarity run for governor. Is she your favorite candidate? Well, listen, listen, don't don't write off U.S. Senate. 
Okay. Right? Because she's obviously, she spent many years in the legislature. Blumenthal's up. I think he's weak. I think Themis can raise in a tremendous amount of money. I'm not saying she's not, you know, she, she can't be governor, but you know, everyone, everyone's, you know, slating her one in one direction. You don't know. Themis has a tremendous following. She has the ability to raise money. Um, so, but she certainly, it will be in contention for either position. If you were Themis Clarity, would you want the one that polls will show you a better chance of in an arena you've been dominating, or would you go for the one where you're going to be way well, outspent and, and the, and the statewide electorate votes more blue? Well, you, but you think that, see, that's the thing, Paul, every election is different. Yeah. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what's going to happen in yeah. two years. Blumenthal could retire. I mean, I'm just saying. That's true. Yeah, you're right. You know, so. Um, it sounds like you'd like it to run for Senate because you don't get many strong Senate candidates, but you will get other governor candidates who can. No, who no, can no, no. I'm not saying that at all. I just I, I, I don't want what I don't want is Themis to be in this position where she's constantly talking about one thing where, gotcha. you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I think she has the talent and ability. So you, you said outspent. Themis can raise a tremendous amount of money. She has yeah. a tremendous following. No, I agree. She so, would be a very legitimate candidate for Senate. She'd be one of. Yeah the few you could put up against Blumenthal, whereas you'll have any number of people who would have a real shot at winning the governor's office. Calls, I mean, Paul. What? What'd you say? You still there, JR? Yeah, I keep getting phone calls. Yeah, tell them you got to one more minute. The last thing I'm going to ask you, JR Romano, is about e-signature. Oh, two things, electronic signatures and mail-in voting. So this year, if someone doesn't, you say you have candidates, for instance, in a couple of your congressional races want the nomination, are you agreeing with challengers that they shouldn't have to get as many signatures this year and they should be able to get them electronically on petitions in order to qualify for a ballot because they say you can't knock on doors the way you normally can and even share are, pennies? What are, do you you think? Talk, are you talking about third party? Are you talking about minor party status? Well, no, the minor about- parties raised it, but so are the... There's also a lawsuit involving Democrats who want to be able to petition onto the ballot. Well, the, the problem is, is I don't agree with the petition rule in the first place. Um, yeah. And frankly, neither does the Supreme Court. We, we actually are looking for at a legal challenge of whether the state can tell us. We are a private organization. It's our ballot. It's not the state's. Um, and so I have a fundamental problem with the, with the signature aspect to the Republican Party. Uh, minor parties, you know, I'll let them figure that out. But in terms of, um, you know, for me, I, I just don't think that the, that the state of Connecticut, who's led by Democrats, um, should should oversee how we give our our ballot access away. It should be entirely up to us. And what about a mail in voting? That's been a a, a divisive issue. In so the, the problem state. the problem with Maryland, and I'm going to be very clear. It's not that I'm opposed to mail in balloting, but the problem is is that the the Connecticut infrastructure is a joke. They have they they actually when you look at and, and Paul, I can show you the 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 statistics. The city of New Haven, for example. The, the, the number of um, voters that are inactive for years that still exist, we have, we, have no, we have no verification of who voters are. So for example, if my cousin used to live, it was a renter in my condo, she hasn't re-registered in her new uh, city, I'm going to get an absentee ballot application for her. Someone nefarious can take advantage of that loop, loophole. Right, you can go down there and quote. She can quote, sign it. <laughs> and you'll right. deliver and, it to I, the mailbox. Well, what's funny is I was on a I was on a call and and someone legitimately said to me, "Voter fraud on the 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 leader Tom Swan on this call said voter fraud only happens in Democrat primaries." So we said. So this well, idea we know that nationally it, it happens in Republican places too, but that no, be but I didn't say. Well, I didn't say it. Did, I believe it happens it's not worth 300, 400,000 votes, but in a race that's decided by 10 votes, it yeah. could be 20, you know? So when you, when I look at this, we have no infrastructure or apparatus to protect people's vote, meaning your vote can be stolen like that. And so yeah. my, my thing is in some of these other states, you have uh, uh, government uh, uh, entities communicating with each other. So when I sign my Department of Revenue Services form, it matches my license. It matches my voter form. We don't do that. We don't check to see if someone's a legal citizen. We don't check anything in our state. And so it's not that I'm opposed. What I see is, is that um, Denise Merrill and the Connecticut Democratic Party want to put a new roof on the house. But the problem is the walls are falling down. 
But what should we and do in the meantime? Wanna... People are scared of dying. And one thing I would argue is that the research does not show that one party benefits. You know, everyone assumes Republicans are hurt. Donald Trump says we'll never get elected. Yeah, but, but Paul, this isn't a party thing. This I is agree. The truth. Yeah, yeah, this is the, the truth. The data shows so, that no party benefits. It's more just people are scared they're going to die if they go vote in Wisconsin. Well, right. But so what I would do is lot. take the, the $5 million that they want to spend on a presidential primary that means nothing. Just And it's just because the Democrats... Oh, boy, we lost uh, the sound there. It oh, yeah. literally means nothing. They're going to spend five dollars. They should take that money, upgrade our uh, system so that uh, agencies can cross communicate, match signatures, buy some buy some uh, equipment for all the towns that can match these signatures on ballots, clean the voter rolls, which we we are non-compliant, by the way, with the National uh, Voter Rights but Act. Denise Merrill, Secretary of State, said they did get a state a federal grant where they're going to do some of that. But Jr., do you take some of the blame along with the Democratic leaders for not preventing a useless primary because you got this rocky guy who's not really? I didn't, whoa, 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 whoa! That was solely Denise Merrill's decision. Well, she had to follow the law. She could no. not by law. Democrats or Republicans. Paul, I'm going to tell you right now, Paul. Paul, you're wrong. Laws. Paul, just stop. You're wrong. She. <laughs> Hold on. I'll give you a point. You can go back and look at this in Twitter. When I asked her to justify putting him on the ballot based under the law, which the law states it, she she could not prove that he met the qualifications under the law. Now, here's the other thing. Here's the other thing that really shows. Well, I mean, just to be fair to her, JR, she was trying not to mess with you. She was saying, I'm not in the Republican Party. There that is incorrect. Paul, Paul, I'm I'm not gonna... Paul, stop. You're wrong. She in 2016, she called me and asked for my input. You know how many phone calls I got this time? None. Hmm. So but she had the same problem on the Democrat side. She's begging Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders. Hold on a sec. Hold on. Time candidate. out. Time out. No, Paul, it's different on the Democrat side. They're hmm. legitimate candidates who have funding, who have actual delegates already. Hmm. When she decided to put these two on the ballot, they didn't even have a path mathematically. This yeah, would, but you can't look at that. That's that's it, that's. Yes, under you can actually, under the statute, you can. Huh. What okay. what she used, and here's the best part, Paul. When I challenged her on proving the, showing me the evidence that led to her decision, she wouldn't show it publicly. She wanted me to come into her office and see it. Hmm. Why not share it publicly? If if you if you can stand by this and the decision to put Rocky on the ballot, why couldn't she, she just get Rocky to get off the ballot? Why couldn't she Trump? Send her She's afraid of being sued. That's what this yeah, what is about. What about you? Why can't you guys get Rocky off the ballot? It doesn't, Paul, be, here's the problem. It's entirely up to him. She put him on, he gets the side. This was right. all her fault. And by okay. the way, the governor can cancel this with his executive power. He's not. Because, and the reason is, is they want to, they, they're going to waste taxpayer money. And here's the best part, Paul, and this, you may not know this. Because he moved the primary to August, it actually is passed the national right. parties both Democrat and Republicans window to submit who their delegates okay. are. Okay, but Jerry, you did see that when Cuomo canceled the primary, a federal judge overruled him, and that the Democrats are scared that Donald Trump is going to cancel election on a by force. So how could they set a precedent where they cancel elections? You understand because that's the president? Because listen, the press, the presidential, and I don't know who New York's attorneys were. They should have called me. The presidential primaries <laughs> is how a, how a party chooses their not doesn't even choose the nominee, chooses their delegates. So this whole thing is, it means nothing. It means nothing. I'm not going to sue uh, 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 because they canceled the primary. Th this, okay. and well, they should quite, have called quite frankly, and I'm just going to say this, anyone, and, and this is the thing that's really selfish of Bernie Sanders and his supporters. I agree. If every, if every, if every life matters. I agree. He has. He, he should he and he's wasting taxpayer money. This is the it's type not, of it's not just Sanders. It's also Elizabeth Warren and Tulsi Gabbard. Well, you know what? The lesson here, Jr., is that someone should always call Jr. And I'm glad that we called Jr. Romano, the state Republican chairman, today to be on Dateline New Haven. I always learn a lot. And I always have fun mixing it up. With Leach wrote in, match it to the IRS. You don't pay taxes. You can't vote. The president said he will not cancel the election. Go Bernie. That's an interesting range of comments from Judith. And um, Harry says, I went out yesterday for a drive, saw people, plenty of people not social distancing. I'm pretty sure I wasn't driving in Georgia. That's good because that way he was able to be here today and be let, the let station me, manager. Let me just clear that up, Paul. Um, Judith's, com Judith's comment stopped at the IRS comment. Oh, okay. 
The rest of it was mine. <laughs> okay, someone sounds like a demopolitan. Okay, so J.R. Romano, thanks for hanging in here today with the technology. And Sorry uh, about and, that. No, no, you were loud and clear the whole second half. And I hope you come back on the show because- Anytime you want. J.R. Romano, State Republican Chairman, thanks for joining us today in Dateline New Haven. And Thank thanks you. for the miracle man behind the controls, WNHA Station Manager Harry Jones. You guys just got a peek in public about what Harry does in private every day, just pulling wires out of the air or other ways to make things work. When he saw that JR was going in and out, he figured out that if JR just didn't use the video on his phone because his internet was out, then his audio would stay on. Harry Dross is the miracle man day in and day out here at WNHH. We're gonna take it out with the Afro-Semitic experience performing I Wish I Knew How It Would Feel to Be Free from the group CD, A Plea for Peace. This is Paul Bass inviting you to fly free with us all day and all night long here at WNHHFM, New Haven's home for community radio. Uh -huh.